open up to Mark chapter eight and then keep your finger there and then turn over to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 is where we're gonna take a portion of our text today. It's a companion text. It's the same story in a different portion of scripture. And isn't it interesting that in today's portion, Matthew 16 and Mark 8, that Jesus asks his disciples, who do men say that I am? And Peter confesses, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, whoa, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And on this confession, I'm going to build my church. Now, if you're a Bible student, we call this the rule of first mention. That is in the scriptures, if you wanna know what's accurate, what's true and what to be trusted, you look at the time in the scriptures where that word is first mentioned. And then you can understand what that word means throughout the rest of Bible interpretation unless you be led astray by some Bible teachers that don't stay accurate. And the first time the word church, you guys ever been to a church before? You at a church right now. The first time church is mentioned is in our text today. We've never seen it before. It's a Greek word that means called out assembly. It's ekklesia. It's a group of people that have been ordained by God to be different, to have a foundation to have a purpose in their life that is countercultural. And Jesus said that to his boys there at Caesarea Philippi. This would be northern Israel, away from Jerusalem, away from the Sea of Galilee, way up north near what we would call Syria and Lebanon. And Jesus took his boys there to pagan country where they were worshiping the God of Pan, even as they spoke. In that area, they had a temple to the God of Pan. And at the backdrop, there was this big rock, Mount Hermon, the base of it. Jesus then began to teach out of Matthew 16. We're gonna take our text there. Let's read it together, beginning in verse 13. It says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And so they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. That was a common thought. Some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah. One group of people says that you're definitely one of the prophets, Well, then Jesus, maybe even unimpressed with these answers, said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus answered and said to him, blessed or happy are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you you are called Peter. And on this rock, that is Petra, his name was now Peter, Petros, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. What, stop right there, eyes up here. This is cray cray. They're up in northern Israel in this pagan area, which by the way, that area where they worshiped Pan at the base of Mount Hermon was actually called the gates of hell. It's where they worshiped and they would take animals and sacrifice them to this God of Pan and live under this rule of panic and chaos and fear. And it was called the gates of hell. And Jesus here, right there in the gates of hell, asks Peter this defining question. Because once you know who Jesus is, Then, listen, listen, then and only then will you ever know who you are. If you don't know who Jesus is, if you're confused, if you're inaccurate, if you have a thought, if you have a perplexion or you have an assumption only as opposed to what Peter had here, which was a revelation, you're not gonna truly know who you are. You see, we live in a culture right now that totally understands identity confusion. Our whole culture has lost its way in so many different relationships and identities and personalities. And yet the Bible hasn't changed at all. The Bible hasn't shifted at all. And we find our identity, we find our marching orders, we find our instructions when and only when we put our eyes and attention on Jesus Christ. And Jesus here, wanting them to answer this question, who do men say that I am? It's not very important what other people think of Jesus as it pertains to as important it is to what you think about Jesus. What I think about Jesus, Luke Frechette, has little to no bearing on what it's gonna look like for you in the eternal life. You can't get to heaven and say, well, I went to Pastor Luke's church. Don't I get to get in for free? (laughs) Pastor Luke had a really sweet beard. Isn't that enough? (laughs) Pastor Luke wore two t-shirts too small for him. Isn't that enough for me? Can I get in? (laughs) 
And once you guys are in between medium and large too, you'll know the problems that I feel. That's not gonna be the question. The question that Jesus is gonna ask you is the same question he asked the boys here. What did you think of me? Now, here's the perplexing part. If you're a Bible student, you'll remember that this wasn't the first time that they had confessed Jesus as the Christ. Throughout the scriptures, they had some information. Throughout the scriptures, they had some speculation. There was some popular ideas. And Jesus now, at this moment, though, something's different. And maybe today's the day for you where something will be different. You see, maybe even in John chapter one, remember John chapter one when Jesus was just being introduced right at the very beginning and he met a guy named Nathaniel. And when Jesus saw Nathaniel, he was like, hey, it's Nathaniel, a man in whom is no guile. And Nathaniel looked around, he was like, how do you know me? I don't know you. And Jesus said, oh yeah, I saw you earlier under the tree praying. And Nathaniel said, no way, nobody's, I, there's no way. If you, you're the Christ. And he knew right away, maybe Nathaniel had put out a fleece, something was going on, but he had some sort of intellectual ascent, some sort of connection, like, oh, oh this is making sense. A couple chapters later in Luke chapter five, Jesus gets in the boat with Peter and the boys. They've been fishing all night, no catch. Jesus said, well, try the right side. They catch the right side, fish everywhere. And Peter falls on his knees and says, depart from me, my Lord, I'm a sinful man. A confession was made. Some information was gathered. And then maybe you remember the story in Luke chapter six. No, nope, that's not true. John chapter six, where Jesus was feeding the 5,000 and then he offended them the next day by telling them they had to eat his flesh and drink his blood, speaking of communion and fellowship by faith. And he lost 5,000 followers. And he looked at Peter. He said, hey, today's quitting day. Today's the day where everyone's leaving me. Do you wanna leave too? And this is my favorite verse in all the Bible. John six sixty eight, when Peter had an opportunity to quit to give up, to walk away. And Peter said this, but Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. My favorite verse, because sometimes you just feel like quitting, don't you? Sometimes you feel like giving up. Sometimes you feel like it's too hard, and it's too tough, and it is hard, and it is tough. But like Simon Peter, you know what you're gonna say? There's nowhere else to go. You have the words of eternal life, Lord. I'm just gonna keep going. I'm gonna DTNRT, do the next right thing. And I'm gonna TTP, trust the process. Well, here's what happened next. One more verse, the next verse, John 6, 69. And we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That sounds pretty clear, doesn't it? Peter had made a confession. He had information. He was speculating and putting it together. But now, months and months later in Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asks him the same question. What in the world's going on here? How many times is Jesus gonna ask me what I believe? How many times is Jesus gonna ask me where I'm at in my faith? I don't know the answer to that question. Maybe he's gonna ask you as many times as is necessary. <laughs> Until, <laughs> I've got a joke, but I'm gonna keep it to myself. Until, until you know that you know that you know that you're a born again, spirit filled, blood bought believer. And I pray in Jesus name that every single person here knows that about yourself, that there is no wondering from time to time, I'll counsel with people and they'll say, I just don't know if I'm saved. And I kind of, I try not to be nice. I try and be, you know, since, oh, what do you mean you don't know if you're saved? I, there's verses that help me to know I'm saved. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you'll be saved. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you're saved. It's not what you've done, it's what he's done. Sometimes I question my sanctification. Lord, I think I'm making mistakes and I'm blowing it right now. Yeah, absolutely you are. We all see your Facebook post. We know what's going on. But that doesn't change your salvation, what God has done for you. But what you need, what I need, what we need, what they got this day was divine revelation that led to then transformation. Did you notice that Jesus changes Peter's name right then and there? He says, oh, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. In other words, this isn't just observation. This isn't just you doing math and thinking, well, these people thought you're John the Baptist and these people think this, but I guess you're the Messiah. That's probably, that'll work. This isn't that. This is a divine revelation for Simon Barjona, where everything's changed for you. And Jesus knew this about Simon. He's looking at him and he says his name, Simon Barjona. You guys know this, Simon means shifty or shady. He was kind of an unstable character before Christ. And then his name was Simon Barjona. That means son of Jonah. There's a bunch of prophets in the Old Testament that we all wanna be like. Jonah's not one of them. You guys know that, right? Jonah was a bum. And so Jesus says, hey, Simon Barjona. Those are both not the best names you're gonna be called Peter. You guys know what Peter means, right? Petros, it means rock, stable one. You're gonna be relied upon, you're the new leader. And he gave to him the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That's crazy. 
He changed his name, his identity, and he changed his activity. Now you're in the driver's seat. You guys who have older kids amongst you, you remember the time when you gave your older kids the keys to the car, the family vehicle, when they got to be 16, and you gave them the keys and immediately called your insurance company? Are we covered, you know? <laughs> called the police, watch my kid. You knew that car was coming back with a few dents in it. You knew it wasn't gonna come back the same way you gave it. And here's Jesus to Peter, changing his name, his identity, giving him the keys. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The power and the authority is given to him. And by the way, God would use Peter in such a powerful way on Acts chapter two as the kingdom of God would be given to us on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 10 as the kingdom of God would be given to Gentiles on Pentecost number two. Amazing stuff. I say all that to say this because I believe Jesus was walking so patiently as he's doing right now with you and with me, patiently with his boys, Two and a half years now, up at Caesarea Philippi, he asks the same question, what do you guys really think? And maybe it was different. Maybe it was at this point in Peter's life where he said, you know what? I know I've seen some things and I've even made some confessions, but I have come to believe you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And it was different that day. Again, being in the ministry for as long as I've been in the ministry, I've seen people raise their hand at opportunities to be saved and I rejoice in that. I've seen people get baptized and get Holy Ghost goosebumps and I've seen people make confessions. But I've also seen those same people, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. And I've seen people that have made confessions and raised hands and been baptized and said they believe find themselves then getting picked off or done away or falling short of the glory of God when things get difficult for them. And I believe Jesus, he turns the corner in this preaching time. Did you notice at the very end when he revealed himself to be Jesus the Christ, the Messiah is like, oh, hey, by the way, don't tell anybody, okay? They're like, what? Don't tell anybody. We're Jews waiting for the Messiah and you've just been revealed to be the Messiah and you don't want us to talk about it? What? This would be like seeing Bigfoot, man, Sasquatch out there. I'm like, oh, we're not gonna tell anybody. We're just gonna keep it to ourselves, you know. This would have been so confusing. And Jesus said, well, you guys, I need to teach you a few more things because I am indeed the Messiah. I'm here, but unfortunately, I'm not here for your program. I'm not here for your earthly agenda. I'm just not. I'm here for a different reason. They wanted him at that point to restore Israel to its glory, to deliver them from Roman occupation, to take over the world. And Jesus said, well, we're not, we're not gonna do it that way. And unless you really, truly, listen, have a revelation of who Jesus Christ is, then when Jesus starts to lead and live your life differently than you had anticipated, and you begin to open up the mail of your daily life and it's not been the way that you wanted, unless you know that you know that you know who Jesus is, you too are gonna find yourself falling off course. You're not going to navigate well through the difficulties that life has planned for you. As a matter of fact, turn over now to Mark chapter eight, where we should be. The same text, read with me the last verse that we just read in verse 30. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. Same story we just left off on. Verse 31, and then he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spoke this word openly. Stop right there, eyes up here. This is crazy. They're up at Caesarea Philippi. He's been revealed to be the Messiah. He puts a hush on it. As a matter of fact, let's go sit down, teachable moment. I've got to take you guys a little deeper in the waters. What is next, Jesus? What's next? Well, I'm going to be suffering a lot in the near future. Sounded like he said suffering. Did he say suffering? You know? And I'm going to be rejected. Reject. Did he just say rejected? And they're going to kill me. I've pretty sure he said they're going to go up. And you would imagine these are disciples of Jesus was as they're processing, they realize if he's going to suffer, if he's going to be rejected, and if he's going to die, then we're going to suffer. Then we're going to reject, be rejected. And we're going to face death and persecution as well. Because as so the leader goes, so goes the followers. And he said this to them openly. Not though until they had divine revelation of who Jesus Christ was lest their faith be in something more silly, lest their faith be in something more prosperous, lest their faith be in something more comfortable. You see, because in this world, you and I, especially Americans right now, I can't speak for the generations before us or the generations after us, but right now we live in affluent times. 
We live in soft days, at least as far as it goes right now. You might have things to complain about and there's all kinds of things that are out of control, but right now we have it very easy. And so when suffering comes your way, when rejection comes your way, when death knocks on your door, we're usually by and large offended. What in the world? How is this happening again? Why is this happening to me? And Jesus here speaking this openly to his disciples, wanting to prepare them for what he already told us in Genesis chapter three, this world would bring to us. Did you know in Genesis chapter three, God was very candid about the world after Adam and Eve had sinned. He said, okay, I'm gonna restore everything. It's gonna be okay. But right now, everything's cursed. It's gonna be hard to be single. You guys notice it's hard to be single? Okay, it's gonna be hard to be married. It's gonna be hard to make a living. It's gonna be hard to be young. It's gonna be hard to be old. It's gonna be hard to be alive. Jesus said all these things in the scriptures. And Jesus also comes back in John 16 and says, in this world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And unless your roots are founded deep in the kingdom of God, then when suffering comes your way, and when rejection is at your doorstep. Or when you, like many of us here, walk through the valley of the shadow of death, if you don't have this firm foundation, you too are going to be scandalized. You're gonna be tripped up, overwhelmed and confused. Jesus does not want that to be the case, so he shares this openly with us. This is what we would call the fine print of the contract. How many of you guys read the fine print of the contract whenever you sign those updates on your phone? Like, you wanna update your phone? You gotta just hit this button here that you read it. How many of you guys read those things, okay? Even your attorney doesn't read those things. Maybe he does, maybe he does, he's paid, but nobody reads those things. I love the contracts where you're like, did you read it? You're like, absolutely, I read it. You didn't read anything. Can you imagine if in the fine print of your newest phone update, it said, by the way, if you hit agree to this, you're gonna suffer and you're gonna be rejected and we're gonna come in and we're gonna kill you. Like, you, would, you probably wouldn't sign it. You'd be like, I'm gonna go to at and and I'm not doing it. I'm switching, switching my plan. Actually, I wouldn't say anything about AT&T plenty of suffering with AT&T too. <laughs> and here Jesus though shares this openly. And there are so many other scriptures to put alongside of this text where Jesus said, if you desire, Paul said this actually, he said, if you desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. He said that to Timothy in his last letter. Peter, who was hearing this right now, Peter had actually processed this principle and when he wrote his second epistle and his first epistle, he said, don't be surprised at the trials you're undergoing as if it was some strange thing. This is God's order for you who are missionaries on purpose. There will be suffering, there will be rejection and there will be death to walk through. And Jesus wants us to have these things knowingly lest we find ourselves offended unnecessarily. As a matter of fact, look at verse 31. He began to teach them that the son of man must. I love that word teach. How many of you guys are slow learners like me? You're a slow learner, you need to take the, the course more than once. And even after you take the course more than once, you're probably still gonna fail the test. That's me, I'm just like, I'm, I wanna learn. And actually there's something really good about learning new things. It keeps us young, keeps us growing. But man, I, I just, here's the good news. We have a very patient teacher. Jesus began to teach them these things. This was gonna be a rough lesson. Peter was gonna reject and object. and was gonna get weird. Name calling was about to happen. And yet Jesus is teaching us lessons. Here's the best news you're gonna hear all day. Right now, Jesus is teaching you and me many lessons. You might not necessarily understand that you're going through a lesson time, a teaching time. But right now Jesus says, oh no, that whole thing you're dealing with, that thing in your singleness or in your marriedness, you think you're just suffering arbitrarily and unnecessarily? <laughs> no way. There's a great purpose for this right now. And if you would settle into what the Lord wants you to receive and wants you to learn in this moment, it's gonna change everything. Listen, and it's gonna redeem the difficulty you're going through right now. Because if you're like me, you look at the difficulty, you just wanna blame somebody. Whose fault is this? Who's gonna clean that up? And why is this happening again? The Lord is teaching us things through suffering, through rejection, and through loss. Well, Jesus teaches this. He speaks this word openly. And then Peter took him aside, verse 32, and began to rebuke him, I'm gonna add, privately. That word I just added, but I want you to see the context here. Jesus is sharing openly of these truths, and Peter is listening, and maybe at this point, Peter's like, hey, that was a little, little, little five-minute break. Hey, Jesus, can I talk to you for a minute over here? Can I talk to you for a minute? And, and, and Peter grabs Jesus and brings him over privately. He's like, hey, man. I don't know what you think you're saying, but you're freaking everybody out. We just confess that you're the Messiah and we have a whole agenda for you, okay? I'll give it to you later. But right now you ain't gonna suffer, you ain't gonna be rejected and you ain't gonna die. Remember Peter? He went to bat for Jesus and he said, not only are you not gonna die, but I'll make sure you don't die. These other suckers, they might kill you, but I'll be your guy. And he began to boast and he was prideful, not knowing what he was talking about. <sighs> Stop right there. Let's give Peter a little bit of benefit of the doubt. Peter did all this ignorantly and out of a huge heart of love. 
Don't you guys love Peter? Peter's so fun to study. He's just a big dummy. He's so awesome. He just loved Jesus. He just loved. He was all put his foot in his mouth all the time, making mistakes. And here he says, no, Jesus, I don't think you should suffer. You're the Messiah. That's going to be real bad for you. you know, I don't think you should die. You'll be rejected. That's a bad idea. I've got another good idea. Let me just make a spiritual application here. Sometimes, all the time, when God gives to us his clear word, remember it says that he was teaching this openly. It was very clear, very easy to understand. But in Peter's understanding at that point, in his ignorance and immaturity and in his pride, he didn't like what God was sharing through God's word. And there are times in your life and my life as well where we'll read God's word and it's very clear and we say to ourselves, <laughs> there's no way he meant what he said. That's super offensive. There's no way he could have meant that. That's not gonna be culturally acceptable. There's no way he said that because when he said that, it sounded like he was talking to me. And here's the deal. God's word is very clear. It's very plain. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't even worry about the things that are unclear and confusing. Sometimes people want to get in the confusing passages. Like, what's that mean here? It's like, that's not my problem. The one that's my problem is the ones that are very clear and I'm struggling with to obey. And here's the deal about God's word. God's word is given to us clear and powerful and he's not asking for our opinions. He's not asking for our additions. He's not asking for our editorial help. Hey, can you help me edit this? So many people today read God's word and say, well, that doesn't apply to me. And so many people read God's word and say, well, that's not culturally acceptable. And so many people read God's word and say, well, that's offensive. Let me just say it this way. If you haven't been offended by God's word, you probably didn't read it right. This book's supposed to offend you. It's supposed to show you God's glory in your need for a savior. It's not supposed to pat us on the back and make us feel better about ourselves. It's supposed to search us and find any and every wicked way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. If this book has offended you and if it troubles you, that's because you understand it and you're reading it right. It's kind of like petting a cat backwards. You ever pet a cat backwards? You start petting a cat backwards, that cat's gonna look at you like, what's wrong with you? Are you new here? We don't do it that, you know? Figure it out. And the best way to fix it is to turn the cat around. Just turn that cat around and keep doing what you're doing. And the cat's gonna look at you and say, thank you for doing that. If God's word is abrasive to you or you don't like it, you don't understand it, you don't accept it, it's because you need to turn your life around, period. You need to get with the program. This is God's word. Don't adjust it, don't edit it, don't change it, don't minimize it. There's historical studies of leaders in our country and people all over the place that have taken paper clips and put them over whole gospels and epistles. And I know people who don't read Peter or Paul because they talked about government and taxes and they just don't want to have anything to do with that. Listen, it takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian. It takes the whole counsel of God's word to touch and to change my life. And we need that right now. Our culture's gone nuts, hasn't it? This is why we put the Bible in the foundation of the building so we would never find ourselves drifting from anything other than the whole counsel of God's word. And we live in a time right now where our country needs God's word, our community, our county. This is a, a, a election season right now. Okay, be praying for our country, be praying for our county, register to vote. Okay, vote like a Christian, vote for what the Bible says is true. But God's given to us his word in order that we would find ourselves adjusting to it. Look what Jesus goes on to say to Peter. I love verse 32. He spoke this word openly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Stop right there, eyes up here. It's as if Peter and Jesus are having a private convo. Peter's telling Jesus what he thinks and Jesus is just listening. Uh Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, thanks, Peter. Uh Okay, hold on. Hold on, Peter, Peter, come with me. And he brings Peter back to the crowd. And then he says this openly. Jesus had just been rebuked privately, but now Jesus is gonna rebuke Peter publicly. And he says this, and he says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And when he had called the people to himself with his disciples, he said to them and went on to another teaching uh, through this opportunity that Peter had given to him. Now, poor Pete. And talk about an up and down day. They're at Caesarea Philippi, hanging out there at the Starbucks near the you know, temple of Pan. Who do men say that I am? And he confesses, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Oh, Simon Barjona. That's the first name he's given of the day. You now shall be called Peter. He gets a new name. And by the end of the day, he gets a third name. Jesus is calling him Satan. Like, come on, man. He's all over the place. And I can relate. Some days it's just a normal day. You're just a normal person. Then you have a revelation, an opportunity. You kind of see something really cool in the scriptures or God uses you powerfully. And then without any warning, you find yourself like Peter being tripped up by the enemy and being mindful of the things of man rather than the things of God. 
This is nuts, by the way. Our minds are a battlefield. There's so much going on in our minds and it is not hard to be mindful of the things of man. We do this easily. The world around us is designed to get us off of our focus and off of our path and off of our purpose. This is why God, I'll just give you three sections. This is why God has given to us the weapons of our warfare, which are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds and taking every what captive? Imagine that. God gives us weapons from heaven to fight the spiritual battle. Oh, what kind of weapons we got? I'm gonna give you the weapon of self-control to take every thought captive. Any hand grenades? Any bazookas? What else we got? Nope, that's the weapon you need. You take every thought captive by the power of the Holy Spirit because the mind is the battlefield where Satan's gonna run amok. And you and I need this right now when the world has gone crazy, sowing all kinds of wanton ideas and false theologies. And God says, I've given to you power to overcome. Take every thought captive. Not only that, but Romans chapter 12 tells me and you that we're to present our bodies to the Lord as living sacrifices, setting our mind on things above, having our mind what? Renewed through the washing of the water of the word of God. And you can have your mind renewed daily as you get into God's word and God's word into you. I heard one person say that Christians and Christianity is just a bunch of brainwashed people. And I thought to myself, I like that. You know what I need washed more than anything is my brain. I need, man, it gets dirty, man. This world's crazy and things get in there. I need my brain rewashed and retooled every single day. Colossians chapter three tells me and you to set our mind on things above, not on things below. I say all that to say this. We're living in 2024. We have the world at our fingertips. Everything we need right now is afforded to us. You can go to a bank and finance just about anything. You can go to an airport and fly just about anywhere. You can accomplish just about anything. You can call on We have so much to do right now. And the world around us wants us to set our mind on things below, not on things above. And Jesus, in this moment in time, with his best friends, the disciples, says, boys, look at me. Do not fall prey to the ways of this world. This world is passing quickly. The temptation is to get all you can and can all you get and sit on the can. Don't do that. Jesus here gives them a better way and he makes this a teachable moment. Look at verse 34 after he rebukes Simon Peter for being mindful of the things of man. And then he goes on to say, when he called his disciples to himself, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Stop right there. Eyes up here. Jesus now begins to preach to this group of disciples. And the first question he asks them before he gives them directives, he says, whoever desires to come after me, then he gives them the steps to do so. I would ask this question. Do you have a desire to come after Jesus Christ? Do you have a desire to be a disciple? Do you have a desire to make your life count? Do you have a desire to be a change, to be the salt, to be the light, to be a servant? You guys are at 12 p.m. It's sunny out still, and you guys are at a church service listening to somebody talk with a big old beard that probably should trim it, but he never will. But you guys are sitting here right now because something in your heart says, I want to do that. I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to be different. And if you have that desire, don't ever take that for granted. Not everyone in the world right now loves God. Not everyone in the world wants to study the word. Not everyone in the world wants to serve the kingdom. Not everyone in the world right now is anticipating his return. Not everyone in the world is worshiping him. And if you have a soft heart towards the Lord, steward that heart, protect that heart. Don't let it grow weary. Don't let it go cold. Don't let it grow wayward. And in order to avoid those pitfalls, Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, let him first of all deny himself. You could just stop right there and everything else follows suit. See, the world we live in right now says serve yourself, care for yourself, more self-esteem, more, we're the selfie nation. I've got 20,000 selfies on my phone, by the way, hold me accountable. It's the culture we live in. Most of the selfies are with other people. They're not just of myself, they're with people, events and things happening. But our culture right now has promoted self, self-esteem and selfism and self-magazine. And the Bible says, ooh, that's the fastest way to be off your path and to be illegitimate as far as the things of God are concerned. And the enemy wants us to be consumed with ourselves. I've shared this from the pulpit before. If you guys want a fast track to be depressed, okay, just think about yourself more. I actually promise you this. The more you think about yourself, the more depressed you'll be. The more you're consumed with what you have or what you don't have or what people think about you or what people don't think about you or what you're gonna do or what you haven't done, the more you just get, I promise you, and the fastest way to anti-depression, 
which the number one prescribed drug in America is antidepressants, the number one drug we're prescribing right now. And I'm gonna give you a different prescription for antidepressants. The number one way to become antidepressed is to not think of yourself at all. Think about somebody else. Think about what somebody else is going through. Think about what somebody else is dealing with. Don't think less of yourself or down on yourself. Just think of yourself less, less often. The more I think of myself, the more trouble I get in. The more I think of myself, the more depressed I find myself. The more I think of myself, the less useful I am for the kingdom of God, period. Take this for a spin this week. Take it for a spin today. Think about other people and you'll find yourself being alleviated from your fears and from your desires and from the things that, as Jesus said, if you seek to save your life, you're never gonna find it. But if you lose your life, I promise you, you're gonna find it. Jesus here, giving these guys deep lessons, deep waters, deep theology, only on the heels of the revelation that you're the Christ, the son of the living God, okay? I hope you can handle this because upon that confession, it's not gonna be easy. There are people out there that write books entitled Your Best Life Now. Their whole church is built on health, wealth, and prosperity. Name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. God wants you to be happy, healthy, and wealthy. People teach this stuff and you're not gonna find it in the scriptures. God wants us to be successful, but on the terms of heaven and on the terms of eternity and on the terms of his glory. And Jesus here, Caesarea Philippi, the weirdest place you could possibly go, sits the boys down, rebukes Peter to his face publicly and says, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This idea of self-sacrifice, this idea of denial, this idea of a connection to heaven, the cross speaks of all these things. He goes on to challenge them in verse 35, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what profit will it be to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Stop right there, eyes up here. In our flesh, there's so many arguments happening right now. The man or the woman who desires to save his soul is gonna lose it, but the man or woman who says, you know what? I don't want to have control over my life. I don't want to decide what's right or wrong. I don't want to decide, Lord, what you wanna do. Lord, would you take my life? That man, that woman, they're the one who are gonna find purpose and life and fulfillment and happiness and usefulness in a life well lived. And yet here's the challenge. You and I have to make this decision every single day, maybe even every single hour maybe even every single minute. Lord, take these thoughts captive. Lord, forgive me of my selfishness and my sin. It's creeping back in. Help me not to, Lord, live for my life, but for your life. He challenges them and says, what profit will there be for a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? He challenges them knowing this. There will be a temptation within each and every one of us to live our lives, to get as much as we can, hoping that that's going to fulfill us, knowing Jesus says here that that's not going to actually bring fulfillment, and he knows that there's not gonna be a way to exchange then what we've earned on planet Earth to get to heaven. What could, well, verse 36, he says it this way, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, loses his own soul, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? There's this ideology that says, if I just live my life and I'm successful and I get a bunch of things here and I don't really mind myself with the kingdom of God, once I get to heaven, I can just kind of exchange what I've done. Lord, look at what I've done. Isn't this enough to get my soul back? There will be no exchange rate on that day. Now, let me say something in case you misunderstand what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with being successful, nothing wrong with being affluent and, and wealthy. As long as your mind and your heart are dedicated and set upon the things of God, God has given to us each time, talent, and treasure, days, dollars, and deeds. I was meeting with the family at the property earlier this week, and we were both complimenting one another on our giftings. They were saying, Luke, thank you for your gifting that you have that you share with us every single Sunday and the way God uses you. And I looked right back at them. They're actually very generous. They're one of our biggest donors in the church. And I said, you know what? I thank you for your guys' gift. God made you successful in the business world. And you moved to Newport. You retired here. You're very generous and you, you don't ask anything in return. You're just, you, that's a gift. Romans chapter 12 says there's a gift of giving. There's a gift of teaching. There's a gift of sharing. God's asked us to live our lives for his glory and for others' good. And if you say, Lord, thank you for making me me, for giving me the gift of being a mom or being a dad or a husband or a wife, looking in the mirror of God's word saying, Lord, who have you made me to be? Well, Jesus here wants us not to miss it. Look at verse 38, final verse of the day. 
He says, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the son of man will also be ashamed when he comes to the glory of his father and with the holy angels. Stop right there, eyes up here. These are heavy theological realities. And Jesus told them there's gonna be suffering. There's going to be rejection. There's going to be death. And then the fourth thing, which I didn't extract in the previous verses, then there's gonna be the rising from the dead. There will be the return. This isn't all we have. This is the waiting room. This is the testing room. This is the challenging room. This is the room where we get to live by faith, where we get to believe two things, that there is a God and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. Here's what Satan wants for you and Satan wants for me. He wants us to get all of the fulfillment and all of the pleasure and all of the glory now without the suffering. This is what the world sells us. Hey, come over here and do these things. It's perfect. There won't be any problems. It's gonna be awesome. Get all the glory, all the pleasure, all the things right now with no suffering. And what Jesus says in this text, no, there's gonna be some suffering. There's gonna be some difficulty, but there will be glory to come after because this world is not our permanent home. We are eternal beings having a temporary experience. And the Lord doesn't want us to blow it, doesn't want us to get tipped over when the going gets tough. And I'm gonna have the worship team come up and we're gonna respond with a song and with prayer. But my heart and my hope for you, my heart and my hope for me is that right now, no matter where you're at in your journey, that the Lord would take you to Caesarea Philippi and he would look at you and have that same conversation he's already had with Peter a couple times. Who am I to you, Pete? Who am I to you, Luke? Am I the Christ, the son of the living God? And as you make that confession through revelation, that it would lead to then transformation, a new name, a new identity, a new trajectory and a new purpose that the Lord would anoint you and use you and prepare you for what the future has. And I wish I could stand up here today and if I had enough money and resources, I'd give you all a ticket to freedom and a ticket to prosperity and a blessing of protection from all illnesses. I wish I I would give it away if I could, but I can't. Instead, I give you the truth where Jesus said, hey, it's not going to be easy for anybody. Did you know that? If you're a non-Christian, non-believer, you don't believe these things, you too will suffer, you will be rejected, and there will be death. If you're a believer, there will be suffering, there will be rejection, and there will be death. This world is cursed. Every single person is dealing with it right now. And Jesus, the Messiah, 2,000 years ago, showed up and was validated by his miracles and signs and wonders and his preaching. And on the third day, he rose from the dead after dying on the cross for the sins of humanity. And he ever lives, the Bible says, to make prayers and intercessions for you. And he's coming back again one day. And what he wants for you, and isn't this awesome we get to be alive right now? Pinch yourself a little bit, just a little bit. You're in the land of the living. I don't know how much longer we got. I don't wanna waste any days. I don't wanna waste any moments. I don't wanna be tricked by the enemy. So I'm gonna ask you guys to stand up and we're gonna pray and ask the Lord to give us a spirit of discernment and wisdom, lest we be picked off by false theologies and doctrines. Lest we be picked off by our own wanton flesh. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17 that the heart is deceitful and wicked above all else who can even know it. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, we only want your will to be done. We only want your word, Lord. We only want your ways. And so we surrender ourselves to you once again. And maybe you're here this afternoon and you would say, I've got questions, Pastor Luke. But more than the questions, I've actually got concerns for my soul. I don't want to blow it. I don't want to miss out. I need that divine revelation that leads to transformation. I need to be changed even right now. I need the Holy Spirit to confirm it in my heart that I'm blood-bought, spirit-filled, born again, going to heaven, that my life is different, that I can be forgiven today, not because of what I've done or somebody else has done, but because of what Jesus has done. Luke, would you pray for me? And if that's you here this afternoon and you desire to go after Jesus Christ and to be spirit-filled, Would you raise up your hand right now in Jesus' name? Say, yeah, I wanna be that man. I wanna be that woman. Lord, take me right where I'm at. As I look around the room, there's dozens of people with their hands up right now. Join these if you're not sure. You need to be sure today that when suffering comes your way tomorrow, you're not shocked. You're not tipped over. You're prepared. Raise up your hand right now if you wanna be prepared for what the future holds for you. You wanna be ready and filled with the Spirit of God, not picked off by silly things. Lord, my hands are up as well, and I repent. 
Lord, I repent in Jesus' name, Lord, for going to lesser things, for grasping for this world, for arguing with your word, for wanting my own way. We repent of our selfishness, Lord. Help us to deny ourselves, to get over ourselves, to be selfless. Would you make us that generation, Lord, that is filled, Lord, with self-control, that we say no to ourselves and yes to the Spirit of God. Fill us, we pray, and forgive us, Lord, where we sin. Thank you, Jesus, and heal us where we're hurting. We love you, Lord. You can put your hands down. We're gonna sing a song of response. If you need prayer during this song, Pastor Rory's gonna come up or some other prayer people will be up on my right. I'll be up on the left here. Come get prayed for or come to the altar and kneel as we respond together. In Jesus' name, amen.